Good morning. The 10 o'clock hour is here. Time for our meeting to start. And the announcement of filing of meeting notice and posting of the agenda in accordance with the open meeting ad has been met. And I call this meeting to order and ask for the roll call. Chairman Stephanie? Yes. Vice Chair Conway? Here. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Now we can move to the approval of the May 17, 2017 Commission meeting minutes. We have a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Second. Call the roll, please. Aye. Secretary Carter. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hamish. Aye. Great. Motion passes. Thank you. Next, Director Bird. We have recognition of our Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission staff. Yes, we have. Uh, today we're celebrating uh, 25 years of service to the state for Dale Williams. So we're going to give him. A nice pin, a nice certificate, and he's been a very good partner in crime uh, with me, I guess I'll say that, uh, for the last 15 years. Dale? Well, Dale and I kind of added a few years <laughs> just for <laughs> retirement purposes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to say anything? I just appreciate all that's uh, happened here with me over the last. 20, about 20 years with aeronautics, I think. And I just enjoy working with the commissioners and the staff. Thank you very much. Bill, I remember meeting you for the first time probably, oh my God, well, I can't even remember how many years ago it was. You really struck me as a very high level professional that does a great job and been that way since I met you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. Yeah, tell the people felt that <laughs> way. <laughs> Another item. Okay. And for recognition of commi former Commissioner Joe Harris. Yes, former Commissioner Emeritus Harris. He doesn't like that title. He makes it he thinks it's maybe it's makes him sound older or higher education or something. So uh, we want to recognize you for your twelve years of service to the Aeronautics Commission, twelve years of putting up with me. And I know that was difficult at times, but uh, we'd like you to take this and have it at your home somewhere in some, oh, we think notorious place. You can show off all the good years of service you gave to the state. Thank well, you thank very you. much. Thank you. And you may want to say a few words, I'm sure. Dale, I can only imagine what you've been through with my 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. It was my great pleasure to have served for uh, the state of Oklahoma in this position and that uh, I, I believe it's a privilege to be able to give back to your your state for uh, all their state does for you and I'm just glad to have been a part of such an august group of men that uh, I served with some of who are gone literally and uh, others who have uh, bright futures ahead of them so good luck to you I think that we are in a very evolving time within the aeronautics business I think drones are going to change the very fabric of what's happening in the aeronautics world. So good luck to you. Thank you. Well, Joe, I wanted to say thank you personally because new guy here, you opened a hand of friendship to me and, and gave me a lot of great advice and, and uh, your 40 some years of aeronautical experience. So was it 44 now? Well, it's pretty close to 44. But stop, Chuck. I, I, yeah. I don't have enough fingers and toes. So. But I really appreciate your service to this group and to the state. Thank you very much. You, Director Bird, director's report now. One thing I want to say with respect to uh, former Commissioner Harris, he was always a champion, steadfast for general aviation and small airports. So all of you should know that. He always, always, his colors on that never changed. And we appreciate that. Uh, the first item in my report is about the Star Spangled Salute. 
there was, as, as I think the commission knows, we're a, a sponsor of this event. This is our event to really put aerospace and aviation front and center uh, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, this year was record attendance, 247,000 people attended the two-day air show. It was actually the gates on Saturday were closed for the first time ever uh, at, at maybe at Tinker Air Force's base is, uh, I think, 75-year uh, history. That was fairly remarkable in itself. Uh, we had, I think, Sandra can correct me if I'm wrong, probably close to maybe 30 legislators uh, take our, our invitation to attend and, and, and come to our chalet for the two-day event. Unfortunately, as some of you may know, the legislature was still in session uh, that weekend still trying to uh, grapple with budget issues, which, which uh, I think they may still be grappling with. Uh, so w some of them were unable to come, but, but needless to say, just to give you just a little vignette that, that displays the value of this, other than the obvious, that many people, that many people exposed to how big aerospace and aviation is in Oklahoma. We unfortunately uh, don't have the funding to do a great uh, campaign on TV about how important the industry is, like OERB can do for oil and gas. So this is our stage. This is where we really strut our stuff, so to speak. But we, we know we've been embroiled somewhat in, a, in an effort legislatively to protect our military training airspace, which is critical to our state. Uh, and on Sunday, we had two representatives out, uh, Representative Vaughn, who's chair of House Transportation, and Representative Ritz. And there had been some, some dip difficulties with Representative Vaughn during the session about our, our bill in that regard, Senate Bill 477. Uh, I think he sat and watched with, with somewhat amazement and awe what the Thunderbirds could do, you know, just, just what they're capable of doing, that kind of precision flying, which is just, you know, beyond some, it really, it, it, you can't articulate what they can do. And one of the points I got to make to him was that's only made possible with the, the hours and hours and days and days and days of training where it becomes literally second nature to do what they do. They don't have to think about it, they just do it. Uh, he also had an opportunity, one of the first people he ran into uh, on Sunday when he came out was Mark Tarpley, who's president of the uh, Statewide Air Force Association chapter here in Oklahoma. That couldn't have been better, and I promise I didn't stage it. Uh, they immediately got into a conversation on this very issue. Uh, and when uh, he and Representative Ritz left, Representative Vaughn said to me, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have an interim study. We're gonna get to the right place on this. Uh, there's no reason that uh, we can't have a, a scenario where there is a balancing where we're protecting the military training airspace and we still have a wind energy industry as well. So it, it, it certainly paid for itself. I uh, gave the annual keynote address to the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center, Center uh, for their FAA Pathfinder Award. This is a real honor. Uh, former Mayor Kirk Humphreys uh, gave the same address several years ago. Uh, former Lieutenant Governor has given the address. Uh, I was really honored that the director of the center, Michelle Coppage, asked me to do that. And as the staff will tell you, it was it was somewhat painstaking. My I, I did give a lot of lot of time and effort uh, to to coming up with what I felt was a fitting speech to recognize those folks out at the Monroney Aeronautical Center that make a difference, that solve big problems, and allow the center to be what it is for our nation's air transportation system. The uh, several, well now it's probably almost several months ago, it seems like that, but uh, went on a little tour with our senior senator, Jim Inhofe. Uh, he has come up with a plan to reform our non-primary entitlement program, which, which the commission certainly has been interested in for the better part of several years. Uh, we went to the Bristow Airport, which is what we're, we're building a new runway there. Uh, uh, coming up, that should start this summer, the construction on that. We are uh, also, there is a company there, Consolidated Turbine Specialists, recognized around the world for its work on PT6 engines. We started our tour there, we, and we, we talked about what the Senator is calling the Flight Act. I, I do not remember what that acronym stands for. I'll just say that it's a, it, it focuses on reforming the NPE program, which is in need of reform. It is part of the FAA Reauthorization Act. 
on the on the Senate side. I think it may be in the House bill too, but I'm not certain about that. Um, we went from Bristow to Frederick, where we talked about it. We also talked in Frederick about the military training airspace issue, uh, a part of our state where that is a, a very critical issue as well. And then we ended up at, uh, I see our, our, our friend here today from uh, OU Westheimer Airport. We ended up there to conclude our tour and uh, there, was, there was good press coverage. Indeed, there was an NPR reporter along with us the entire time. And, and let me just say, so there won't be any dispute about this, Senator Inhofe is an excellent pilot. I never felt any nervous twang, uh, pangs whatsoever, and it was a great flight in his Cessna 340. So I don't, all those who say otherwise, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm here to testify it was a, gr it was a great trip. Myself, uh, Commissioner Stuckey, and Grace and Artis, we at the uh, State Regents for Higher Education, there was a seminar which they give most of our higher education institutions today will have a division or department dedicated to economic development uh, in the local area. They bring those people in for, to be, uh, to study and to hear uh, sessions about economic development. One of the ones this year, which we were really happy to assist the state regents in, was developing your local airport, making it all it can be insofar as an asset for the local and regional economy. Uh, it was, a, I think we, we, we tag teamed them, and of course, Wes did just this for years. Uh, at the Ardmore Municipal Airport. Uh, it was kind of, he was premier in that regard in developing an airport and setting it and putting it in a place where the opportunity will, will come around for years at that airport insofar as economic development is concerned. I, uh, in, in June, I went to the, as, as uh, you know, we're, uh, I'm on the US, US Contract Tower Association Poli Policy Board. Uh, our own Walt Strong is the chair of that board. But that is in the latter part of June every year. We have a contract tower workshop and a policy board meeting. I go to that and I also take the opportunity to visit with our delegation about issues that are important to us, to aviation in Oklahoma. Uh, I did see all of our delegation, uh, the staff persons who represent aviation and aerospace. And I also met personally with Representative Russell and Senator Inhofe. Uh, in those meetings, I stress the importance of the military training airspace issue, which we are also working on the federal level. Uh, Senator Inhofe and, and Congressman Russell are leading that effort on the federal level. Uh, also talk to them about the ATC privatization issue, which is uh, ramping up and getting a lot of attention right now and being hotly debated. Uh, our delegation, as I'll talk about a little bit more, has, has pretty much steadfastly been opposed to that. Uh, there's been some recent developments in that regard, but I still believe at this time our delegation is opposed to that proposal that is in the FAA House reauthorization uh, bill. Uh, we have a new Secretary of Transportation, which I think most of you know. Uh, Secretary Ridley uh, retired from that position, and Director of ODOT, uh, Mike Patterson, has, is now the Cabinet Secretary as well. I've known Mike uh, ever since I came to Aeronautics as Deputy Director in 2002. Uh, we had a meeting on July the 3rd. I went over with him some of our most pressing issues, uh, among them the ones I have mentioned, military training airspace, uh, ATC privatization, and several others. I really look forward to a great working relationship with Secretary Patterson. We had a very good relationship with Secretary Ridley. And I think there's one little edge that Secretary Patterson may have over Secretary Ridley. He's a pilot. He's a general aviation pilot. So I think that he, he really has a heart uh, for our issues. And so I think that's going to be a great relationship going forward. That's Any questions? Good. It's been busy. <laughs> that's good. Great. Well, moving in. Any questions for, for Vic at this point? Okay. Uh, moving on to item number seven, the legislative, congressional, and regulatory update. Uh, Sandra, you going to start out? Morning, commissioners. Morning. I'd say we had a pretty good year at the legislature, uh, and um, I brag about us because it's our team and our staff that uh, really made that possible. Um, the first item on your agenda is House Bill 1510. House Bill 1510 
uh, is the omnibus bill for all the license plates that were done. We originally started with Senate Bill 196 with Senator Stanislavski in the Senate, and they moved us into an omnibus bill. And our bill was signed by the governor. And so what I want to talk to you about, specifically about this, is um, to help you understand the process of this. So we are in the process currently of designing our license plate. And the Oklahoma State Senate Historical Preservation Fund is a nonprofit 501c3 that has allowed us to use their um, association to commission a work of art, a painting, that will serve as the aviation license plate. Currently, we're in the negotiations with Boeing uh, to sponsor the plate, and uh, the Air Knox Commission uh, will have non-exclusive rights to the entire image use, and there's a contract later that I'll discuss with you about that. Uh, most people use graphic designers. Uh, we wanted an amazing license plate that represents aviation, and the artist that we selected is Chris Nick. Chris Nick is a student of the Honorable Mike Wimmer, who also has several pieces in the Oklahoma State Capitol. And Chris um, has a unique way of painting things, and so I think that uh, what we're going to get from, from uh, Chris is going to be good. Now, before I show you this, uh, this um, sketch, just know this is a sketch. This is not detailed. This is not in color. You'll see that there's a Boeing Grayson 737 and a Boeing AWACS, and that's a Cessna 172 on the other side with a beautiful uh, pavement runway, and uh, so we're wanting to highlight the Oklahoma airport system. And this is what the tag would look like. These are uh, able to be personalized, so the first 100 tags have to be sold before the plate goes into production. November 1 is when the law goes into effect, and that's when the Tax Commission tells me that that's when we'll begin selling plates. However many cars you have, we would like for you to buy a plate, and everyone in the audience, Christy Slater, needs to buy a plate as well as everyone at the Wiley Post and Westheimer airports. Okay, the money raised from that, the, the tag will only be $35, it is annually, and $11 goes to the Oklahoma Tax Commission, and $24 goes to aviation programs within the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission, and uh, I will yield to any questions. Chris, are you going to approach Boeing at their airplane in the middle of the plate? Uh, we are in, yes, we are in, we are in um, conversations currently with Boeing, and I think that uh, we're leaning toward securing that contract. Uh, the painting is expensive, and uh, the art that is done at the Oklahoma State Capitol ranges from $7,500 to $30,000. And that is not, uh, Chris Nick has greatly reduced his fee for the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission to be able to accomplish this. No, what I was saying is there's about 4,000 Boeing employees. Yes. Here in town. Yes, uh, Steve yeah. Hendrickson is who we're visiting with. And we would love for Boeing to get 4,000 employees to, mm -hmm. to, to personalize an Oklahoma aviation plate. But we appreciate them sponsoring the. the uh, I, I wondered if there was a direct link between their sponsorship and their aircraft on the plate. I, I think there is. Uh, yes, I, I would okay. admit that. But, but we did, in deference to Commissioner, former Commissioner Harris, we, we wanted to make sure general aviation is represented as it is, and military aviation, which are the three major components of our aviation here in Oklahoma. Tell you this also there was a lot of discussion among the staff uh, we did not jury this out because we thought that that might be overwhelming to us we did approach a major airlines first prior to Boeing to help us with this project and they declined so that is that is there any okay. further questions Uh, so th this is passed and one November it'll start, you say? Yes. Okay. It, we have to have a design. Our bill is in law. The governor mm -hmm. has signed it into law. And if I just have to create an in-design file that says aviation across it, we've got to do something. Okay. So we are in, we are pushing as, as uh, much as we can. Boeing assures me they're going to have an answer for me by Friday. When and do I have do have another sponsor lined up in case Boeing fails to uh, want to enter in this agreement with us. 
When do we have to have 100 flights? We have 180 days from November 1 to have 100 prepaid plates. If that doesn't make, no plate. Air Force Association, Boeing current, Boeing retirees, and we're, we're counting on you. There's and everybody little, in the audience. Yeah, there's a little event gonna, that's going to happen in Westheimer in September that I plan to go and hit up about 20,000 people. So, okay, are, are we okay here? I think we're okay. Okay, yeah, thank so. you. Okay, uh, Senate Bill 230 uh, was um, placed into statute as Women in Aviation Day. December 9th, which is Pearl Carter Scott's birthday. Pearl Carter Scott flew with Wiley Post. She is a native of Marlowe, Oklahoma. She is a proud Chickasaw, even though she is deceased. A painting of her hangs in the Oklahoma House of Representatives with her plane. She began to fly at the age of 13. And we have been working with uh, several aviation groups. And I just want to tell you a little bit about how this bill came about. Catherine Tabor, who is on our staff, uh, was a great inspiration to this bill. Women in aviation uh, contribute greatly, and uh, I know that Christy Slater and OAOA also uh, champ helped champion the bill with the legislature. And uh, Senator B uh, Paul Scott from, Mar uh, from the Duncan area, who has the Marlowe area in his district, was the author. And there was a little hazing because it was his first bill, which brought us a great amount of press. And so we um, enjoyed having, because of that, seven House female lawmakers sign on to the bill as a co-author and four Senate female lawmakers sign on as a co-author. And we look to have um, events all around the state on December 9th. And that brings us to Senate Bill um, 47, which is Aviation and Aerospace Day. The law does not go into effect until November 1 but we will be celebrating it nonetheless August 19th because it is also uh, National Aviation Day, uh, which is the birthday of Orville Wright. And um, the Oklahoma Air Knox Commission will focus on encouraging and assisting the 109 airports comprising the Oklahoma airport system to hold festivities and conduct first flights for school children, host an open house or provide airport tours on this day. House Bill 2179 was our APA cleanup bill. And I wanted to talk to you just briefly about the process. Uh, when the director and I were first discussing legislation last summer, I told him that I felt like on, on critical bills that we should start a bill on each side of the House. Um, so House Bill 2179 started with Representative Charles Ortega, and Senate Bill 477 started in the Senate with uh, Senator Newhouse. And House Bill 2179, towards the middle of the session, was a beautiful, clean bill. It was unamended, and it was going through the process without a problem. And uh, we were approached by the Senate leadership to assist them in a military training route effort to um, assist Altus and Vance Air Force bases. And so we offered them Senate Bill 477 to use that as a vehicle for the language that they wanted to insert. So we were fortunate to have both of those vehicles in place. And House Bill 2179 was also indeed signed by the governor. Uh, APA was passed in 21, and House Bill 2179 tweaks the existing law in several areas. In the past, those applicants who received a permit and desired to microsite the structure would have to apply for a new permit and pay another $200 application fee. Under this new language, micrositing will be allowed to an existing permitted structure. In addition, those applicants who may have had to file an application for a temporary structure in the past will no longer have to do so under the new language. This law applies to all public use airports, including Oklahoma military airports. However, this law only applies to airspace in the immediate vicinity of public use in military airports. The remaining 95% of Oklahoma's airspace is unaffected by this law and does not really have uh, anything to do with Senate Bill 477 or the protection of military training routes or drop zones. Any questions regarding House Bill 2179? You say the governor signed it? Yes. So it, it is law then? Yes. Okay. And uh, just uh, to point out, Grayson Ardes, uh, our airport division manager, wrote the bill. He did a fantastic job, and uh, he administrates the program 
and uh, knew exactly what we needed to do and the governor was pleased to sign it. Senate Bill 254 is the airport inspection program legislation and it was actually signed twice into law this session by Governor Mary Fallon, first via Senate Bill 254 by Senator Adam Pugh and ultimately via House Bill 1681 by Representative Harold Wright. In the case of two bills being signed into law, it is the latter bill that becomes statute. And so House Bill 1681 is our vehicle for that. And uh, OAC currently inspects all public use airports to ensure our airports are safe for the flying, flying public and collect vital airport safety data. There's an agreement with Maceo that we have uh, that allows us to do this and uh, we put it in state statute just in case that agreement went away to ensure the safety of the flying public. Okay, any questions on Senate Bill 254, Airport Safety and Standard Inspection Program? Senate Bill 433 is the last of my presentation and it uh, raised aircraft registration fees which were established in 1976 by the legislature based on a motor vehicle registration in the state. For over 40 years, aircraft fees have remained unchanged in the state of Oklahoma. Senate Bill 433 adjusts the fee schedule for inflation through a 50% increase across the board to the aircraft registration fees while keeping registration at affordable rates for aircraft owners. The fees are paid by its users and go back into the Oklahoma airport system. I would yield for questions. Any questions? Thank Great you. job. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Commissioners, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, uh, but if you do have any questions, please just stop me and ask. Uh, I'm going to clarify a couple of things, too, because I think there may be a little bit of confusion with respect to Senate Bill 477 and House Bill 2179. Let me say one thing about 433 real quickly, the registration fee. First of all, it's, it's very constitutionally sound. It's not going to be challenged like some of the other issues you've seen being challenged about how the legislature came up with the budget. Uh, this is a fee, has been a fee, uh, uh, it's un but this, it's unfortunate this is the way we have, we have decided as a matter of policy that only through the registration fee and our aircraft excise tax is how we're going to fund our infrastructure needs insofar as aviation in this state, but it's pretty clear that's, that's the way it is. Uh, I don't, uh, aviation fuel tax, uh, that's, uh, we have the lowest in the country just as we have the lowest motor fuel tax. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty difficult issue. So I don't know that we'll return to that issue anytime soon unless there's a groundswell that, hey, this, this really is the best way to fund an infrastructure system in the fairest way. House Bill 2253, uh, the aircraft excise tax charter exempt. Let me, let me talk about this very quickly. 12 states don't even allow for this. Now this all these bills are not dead. They are simply laid over. They'll, they'll re, they will re, be revived next session exactly where they were insofar as their posture this last session. So 2253 is a live round. If it, if it gets through the House, it goes to the governor to be signed. Twelve states don't allow for this at all. Twelve states allow it only to the Part 135 certificate holder. That leaves 26 states. 25 states require some there's got to be some percentage of use that's for charter operations. Uh, Maine is, uh, no, I'm sorry, Kentucky is exclusive, 100%. Maine is 80% the first two years and 50% thereafter. The other 23 states, if I'm doing my math correctly, require 50% usage to be charter operations. One state, one state, no, no, no standard whatsoever. So once the person who buys the aircraft gets it on a Part 135 certificate, it never has to be used for a charter. It's not right to the other people who pay their aircraft excise tax, including people like Devon and Continental Energy. Senate Bill 705, passing the cap on the aircraft excise, raising the cap on the aircraft excise tax. That one is, uh, ran into a, a bit of a snarl. <laughs> For obvious reasons, uh, we, have a real, we had a really hard time coming up with a budget. So any impact on general revenue was looked at with uh, great skepticism and scrutiny. Uh, we have indeed this year, Jane will give you the exact figure, but I believe it's about, we, we, our cap is 4.5 million. This is 4.5 million, 
taken from aircraft owners who pay their aircraft excise tax and expect it to be used on the aviation infrastructure system. We went over that this year, 1.2 million. That 1.2 million went into the general revenue fund. So it's, it's just it's somewhat a replay of when $3 million was taken from the Aeronautics Commission. $1.2 million by law was moved from our revolving fund or never actually hit it, because once we hit the cap, it went straight to general revenue. We've got to get some relief in that regard. So we'll be pressing that again next session to, to at least get it raised. It probably will not be for FY 2018. It will probably be for uh, FY 2019, if I've got the numbers. Maybe FY 2020, but FY 2019. It won't be for the fiscal year that started July 1st. Uh, SB 630, drones protecting property and privacy rights. Uh, I think there's a good chance this bill may may actually be one that w we we don't revive. Uh, we'll, we're going to have to check with our authors about their commitment. There is a a piece of legislation quite similar, doing a, attempting to achieve the same thing at the federal level, referred to as the Drone Federalism Act. Some of you have probably heard of that act. It puts in the 200 foot ceiling. It returns federalism that you know, state and local governments, uh, which is our, should not be just omitted from this conversation. Uh, there, are, there are property rights and privacy rights that state and local governments have been the defender of and champion of since this country was founded. And those were somewhat trampled uh, by the FAA with part 107. It was a, if you really want to talk about unconstitutional takings, that was a very, a massive, unprecedented, and unconstitutional taking of private airspace, and that concept does exist. How much airspace do you need over your property as a homeowner or a commercial property owner to fully enjoy the property? SB 477, let me, let me make it clear, House Bill 2179 did, did not achieve our objective of protecting military training airspace. That, that, that was not a vehicle for that. That was simply some housekeeping. I do want to point something out that I think is very significant. We did something in that bill, House Bill 2179. We, we allowed for micrositing, adjustments, tweaks, and, and business or the applicant, you don't have to come back in and apply again with the Aeronautics Commission. In our entire seven years of administering this act, we have been extremely business friendly. Ask Coke Industries. S. Coke Industries that we could have fi fined thousands of dollars for what they did up at Enid at the fertilizer plant because they had not complied with APA. We didn't take that position. We were reasonable. We've been reasonable about how we've administered this act. And I underscore that because that's somewhat at issue in our current debate uh, with wind energy over what we're trying to do in Senate Bill 477, which is to protect the military training airspace. I think we have a slide, if you put it up, Sandra, the military training, these are the military training routes assigned to Vance Air Force Base. I, I do know that Commissioner Putnam is, is very familiar with this and, and there's a real place in his heart for this. Now, those, the light blue are the routes, by the way, all the military training routes in the state of Oklahoma, what, how much of their, our airspace do they take up? 19.6%. I was not ever great at math, but I think that leaves a little over 80% of our airspace where wind turbines can be erected with, with no issue whatsoever. But you'll see on this slide that the blue ones, the blue are completed wind farms. I would uh, direct your attention to the lower part of the screen uh, for the commissioners and, and the audience, lower part of the screen to, to our left, uh, and you'll see one military training route where it's just, it's just, you can hardly see the light thunder blue anymore because of the dark blue. Well, I don't know which one's thunder blue, but that, those are all turbines, wind turbines, wind farms that have literally made that route at that point unusable for the type of training the United States Air Force needs to do. Not only by Vance Air Force Base, by the Tulsa 138th Fighter Wing that uses these routes. Tinker uses these routes at times. Tinker also uses routes that are assigned to Altus Air Force Base. And we know we've got somewhat the same picture at Altus Air Force Base where a lot of C-17 pilot training is done, where military training routes have been compromised, drop areas, 
and traffic patterns. Right in the middle, maybe to the right, that's Vance Air Force Base. And you'll see there that there's already quite a few wind turbines that are right around that traffic pattern. That's, that's the circle. And then they have got proposed ones that are inside the traffic pattern. Now, wind has characterized our effort here as, as somewhat as what we say with respect to ATC privatization. It's a solution looking for a problem that doesn't exist. Really? It doesn't exist. Ones already that have been that have already been completed, ones that are under construction, and ones that are proposed. And no one, no governmental entity can stop them right now. It, it's, a, it's out of balance. It's not in balance right now. Our bill, 477, and this is very, very important, has never, ever stood for the proposition that we want to prohibit wind turbines from being constructed even in military training airspace. We've in fact drafted the language so tightly that wind could put up turbines right underneath the military training route. And let me just throw something in here. I, I get a little wound up about this. Hmm, so what's the, I know Commissioner Putnam knows this real well, but probably Commissioner Conway does as well. So the altitude where a military training route starts, 500 feet. How tall are these turbines? Right. So, you know, God, do you want to be the pilot training and doing the low-level training you need to do? Well, you got four-foot clearance. You know, come on, you're, you're, you're ready to be a Thunderbird right now. No, they're training. And that, that indeed, that, that, that kind of underscores the problem here. But our bill has never been about, our bill, along with the Strategic Military Planning Commission, has never been about prohibiting. It's been a permitting process, just like APA is right now. The only state agency that has been given the author given siding authority with respect to wind turbines is the Aeronautics Commission. Under the Wind Energy Act that was passed that gave the Corporation Commission certain very limited powers, there is no siding authority. That's why you, some people ask, why do we have wind turbines in the Arbuckles? I won't get all, but well, there's, there's really not a way to stop it right now. The FAA has some siding authority, but it's under Part 77, which I think most of you know, why did we do APA in the first place? Because Part 77 wasn't necessarily working to protect our public airports. So this is what Senate Bill, for, it, is a, it is a permitting process, nothing more, nothing less. We actually will allow, there would be some construction allowed uh, underneath military training routes. We, we have insisted upon a corridor entries and exits, you got to have that or these become unusable. And the, the, the whole essence of this issue about protecting our military training airspace, that's why these bases are there, because of the military training airspace. If it is a state asset and an asset of our nation's government uh, and the United States Air Force in particular, but if we don't take steps to protect this, the Air Force will go where it needs to go to do the training it needs to do so we will continue to have the finest pilots in the world and we'll have a record that's unmatched anywhere that we haven't lost a ground soldier to an enemy air attack since April 15, 1953. There's a reason for that because of our absolute unquestioned air superiority and it starts right here with the training that our pilots can get in military training airspace like this. It is, I, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. It is a matter of national security. And this is one of the biggest assets in, assets in our state, our, our state's military. And I think we have a duty to do what we can do to protect this military training airspace and be balanced and still allow for the wind energy industry as well. No one has ever proposed anything different than that. May I add one thing? Uh, the 500 foot on those training routes is a ceiling. C-17s go thundering across southern Oklahoma at 350 knots at 200 feet. And that's what they do in Afghanistan. So uh, having four-foot clearance is useless. It just yeah. blocks the route completely. And he, these routes are not restricted just to Oklahoma. I mean, Texas, when I was Correct. flying out there, they were always in Oklahoma. So we've got Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. You know, it's a national issue, not just an Oklahoma issue here. It is, and we are working it on a national uh, level as well. 
there has been, and, and Wind will like to assert this, that, well, there's a DOD clearinghouse in place that was established in 2011 in the Defense Authorization Act. Well, here's how the DOD clearinghouse has worked. Not very well. I'd put quote marks around work. It hasn't worked at all. And it's, a, it's somewhat of a two-pronged problem. DOD has interpreted uh, their, their ability to object to FAA, to file their objection to FAA in a Part 77 process application uh, very, very narrowly. It has to be a real imminent threat to national security, not what's in the very regulations, which have three conditions, but they've interpreted it very, very narrowly that we're talking about DEFCON 2. We're talking about Cuban Missile Crisis stuff. That's not what's in the regulations, but unfortunately, due to an interpretation in DOD, right after the clearinghouse was set up, rarely ever, and th this is key, rarely ever is an objection file. They can't meet the standard that has been put in place at the Pentagon. So that leaves our commanders of Vance, Altus, the commander of the 138th Fighter Wing, F-16s at the Tulsa Air Guard Base, really begging, pleading, because there is no balance. There's no leverage right now. Throughout our history of APA, all the applications that have been filed by Wind Energy, we've denied 10%. None of those have ever been appealed to you because we were solid on our reasoning. There have been many, many that have been worked out. Well, if you'll just move that a little bit this way, you won't penetrate that surface or you'll be outside the, the three miles around the airport, uh, but you, we, we need to get you outside the approach surface. Why was that give and take negotiation possible? We had leverage. We could say no. If there's no leverage, forget the art of the deal. It's not going to happen. Let me move quickly to congressional issues. I'm just going to talk about FAA reauthorization. The ATC privatization issue is, is fully at full speed insofar as a debate. Our position has been to oppose that. I've been very proud of our delegation. Uh, it has been opposed to that. Uh, Senator Inhofe's been a leader. Congressman Russell has certainly been a leader. If, if, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go online, uh, look at his speech he gave on the floor of the House, very impassioned about what a bad idea this was, in, you know, searching for, ser truthfully searching for a problem, you know, searching to solve something that, that there isn't a problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting how that's developing. Uh, the administration has jumped on board uh, with, with that effort. I think it likes very much the word privatization, uh, but that hasn't changed the nature of the bill. On the merits, it's a very bad uh, uh, proposition, and what it, the impact it has on the Mike Minoni Aeronautical Center would, would also be very devastating for the state of Oklahoma. The Flight Act, which I mentioned, Senator Inhofe's uh, inspired legislation to reform NPE, that is uh, uh, progressing. The Senate reauthorization bill is going much faster than the House reauthorization bill because of the ATC privatization issue. However, the Senate is a little held up too over many of you are familiar with the 1500 hour rule for commercial pilots. Uh, that is, uh, they're trying to actually reduce that and focus more on the quality. I don't know, the New York delegation uh, Republican and Democrat alike is lockstep against that because that's where that Colvin, Coglin air crash took place that led to the 1500 hour rule. And actually, uh, I believe the Commercial Pilots Association has come out opposed to uh, reducing those number of hours. So that's a little snag right now in the Senate process. I do think though after the August recess, I think sometime in September, that's already passed Senate Commerce. I think that will actually move to the Senate floor and then we'll We'll see what's going on over on the House side. This is a, uh, I would encourage you to weigh in with your respective representative in the House. Uh, this is a fight about air traffic control privatization. It's probably never going to go away. It's come around again and again and again. Uh, just not a reason for it. Rules, we're going to be doing some uh, rule changes to just mirror the, the tweaking that's, uh, we'll bring that to you next meeting. Uh, to initiate that process, and that's just to match what we've done in the uh, in the House Bill uh, 2179 insofar as tweaking APA. Any questions, commissioners? 
Okay. Great report. Thank you. Thank you. Jane, tell us how good our finances are. Um, in your packet behind tab number eight is the financial information. All the numbers are based on the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. And on the first page shows the June 30th, at June 30th, the commission had an ending cash balance of just under 5.3 million with 3.5 million encumbered. Um, there's also an additional 1.3 million pre-encumbered, which is the remainder of the FY17 capital improvement program that has been approved, but the projects have not been granted yet. As of June 30th, the commission's year-to-date expenditures totaled 6,149,172 compared to 5,790,689 last fiscal year. Um, most of the difference is capital projects. And then on the second page um, shows the statutory revenue deposited, which is, as I've explained to you before, the deposited and collected are, they, that can make a difference in some of the numbers. Um, so the deposited total for April was 992,275, for May was 89,182, and June was 42,023. Um, then on the third page, it shows the collections. Um, for FY17, the total collections were 6,289,145 and 5,632,781 of those collections were aircraft excise tax. And like Director Bird said, due to the cap that's on our um, on that fund now, we deposited a million one thirty two seven eighty one that went into the general operating fund for the state. Um, to compare the statutory revenue collections for June first through the thirtieth of FY sixteen, that total was five million three twelve two oh five. So we've actually had an increase of our actual collections. Um, and I wanted to note the red numbers on that last page, on that page, shows those numbers are actually what was collected. It's not what they deposited in our account because they didn't deposit anything over the 4.5 million. So the average is figured on what was actually collected. Um, okay, and then um, I lost my spot here. Here it is. Um, as of June 30th, 2017, the commission's year-to-date year expenditures is 6,149,172 compared to 5.7. I've already told you that, sorry. Page four <coughs> is the budget information. Um, and it's the last page. You will see a summary of the budget numbers submitted to the Office of Management and Enterprise Services in the last week of June. Um, the projected revenue is comprised mostly of aircraft excise tax, aircraft registration fees, and fuel tax. And the most of the rest of it comes from when we pay for a project up front and then we're reimbursed for it. So it has to do with the capital projects. Um, and then there's a small amount from APA and sale of wind socks and that kind of stuff. <coughs> the expenditures, um, the amount shown for the expenditures on the capital improvement program is for FY18 capital improvement program. It's for that. It's not any of the 17. It's just the 18 is what we're going to encumber for FY18. The FY17 projects that have not been completed, the money is still setting aside for those that will be able to go ahead and fulfill those. This will be new money for FY18. And then you can see the um, aviation education budget and the administrative budget. The system that we enter all of this into had a major crash right after we entered the numbers. So we had to submit them on sheets, On had to go back and enter them on spreadsheets and resubmit them. And that's been done. Um, the budget has been approved. I did get approval on it Monday, but it has not been posted yet. I'm hoping maybe today it will get posted so that we can start paying some bills. <laughs> Um, 
any of this that you might have any questions about now or later at any point, I'm happy to give you any more detail or anything you might need on the budget or um, the financials at any time. You can let me know, but if you have any questions for me. Well, I have one. Which is? <coughs> we banded, you know, batted the four and a half million dollars around for quite a while when we decided to set the limit. And the look back for several years was we rarely got close to that. So now all of a sudden we've jumped. <clears throat> Obviously, it's a lot of people are buying airplanes. Is, you know, and we're trying to reestablish a new cap. And is there any projection of what you would speculate the cap might uh, be adjusted to? Let me, uh, yes. We were attempting to increase the cap to six. It, uh, we felt when we did 4.5, which, which the legislature sought our input on that, and I, I appreciated that very much, mainly Representative Earl Sears in that regard. Uh, we were pretty a bit, we were low. We were not doing well in aircraft excise tax. So it's kind of a dual-edged sword. I mean, it, it, what we've done this year, Oklahoma's economy is coming back, particularly oil and gas, as they, and you've seen it everywhere. Oil and gas buys aircraft. They, they, they refresh their fleets, they buy new ones that, oh, we're going to go ahead and buy that now. So that, that's all good news. Uh, the bad news is we have the cap. It's more of a function now, less of us looking at, well, what's anticipated, more what's palatable over at the building across the street, given they're going to continue to struggle with budgetary issues until there are some really major reforms done in the way we budget and things like that. And, and we find, frankly, new revenue sources. Uh, that, that's what, what will, you know, what, what can we sell over there? What, what would be uh, amenable to them? I, of course, I'd love to get it. why this needs to be off. There, there just aren't, I don't know that I can find another agency that has, that is apportioned as us, meaning non-appropriated, where one of their statutory revenue streams has been capped. Now, there are many examples of cap programs, how much can go, you know, that are at generally appropriated agencies. Uh, but I think six million will be pretty much all that can be. This year, I think we came in, obviously, we collected around 5.7, and that's why it started going into general revenue. Uh, six million is probably all that will bear right now until we get our budget house in order, and, in, and hopefully it'll happen in the next few years and we can get to a place where we could actually get passed across the street that there won't be any more cap. Aircraft excise tax, which is one of our main two funding sources that we depend upon to do what we need to do if our aviation infrastructure, uh, the cap will be off. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, the Oklahoma Municipal League Conference, please. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, the Oklahoma Municipal League Conference will be held in Tulsa September 12th through 14th, and the Oklahoma Air Knox Commission will be in attendance. This is an audience of over 400 mayors, council members, trustees, city managers, clerks, electrical superintendents, public works directors, and other municipal officials representing approximately 120 uh, Oklahoma municipalities. OAC will have a general session presentation at the uh, of the Aviation e Economic Impact Study on Thursday afternoon, as well as a booth at the Convention Center in Tulsa, where the expo is held. Uh, we have a great relationship with the Oklahoma Municipal League. They allowed us to use their conference room earlier this year for drone school, and uh, they have recently hired a new executive director, Mr. Mike Fina, who I've known for quite a while. Uh, it's a wonderful organization, and, and we would love to uh, have your approval. Staff recommends approval for a $250 sponsorship which pays for our booth there. Correct me to approval. We have a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Any questions? None. Call the roll please. Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes. Thank you. Sandra, the next item Thank is Tinker in the Primes. Entering a license agreement number item 10, there's a contract be, uh, in your packet uh, under item 10. 
and uh, I emailed this. Hopefully you re read over it. This is a license agreement that comes from the artist Christopher Nick, and the agreement was written by attorneys at the Oklahoma State University um, Board of Regents. They um, entered into an agreement with Chris Nick over paintings for Gallagher and Iba, and so we have uh, used this as a template for our contract as well. The license agreement um, also enters in with the Oklahoma State Senate Historical Preservation Fund, um, allowing us what they call non-exclusive worldwide perpetual and royalty-free license use re to reproduce, distribute, and display said artwork and print digital media for any Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission or Oklahoma State Senate Historical Preservation Fund, Inc. endeavor for profit, promotional or otherwise. It gives us exclusive rights to everything. The artist holds the copyright, but we would have non-exclusive use. We could use it for anything. I could make you t-shirts if you'd like. Uh, staff would recommend uh, approval of entering into the license plate image use agreement. Great. So moved. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further questions? Please call the roll. Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes. And now, Thank you. Tinker and the Primes. I've got a little ahead of myself. Okay. Tinker and the Primes is being held August 21st through the 23rd at the Reed Center. We offer to participate. We are partnering with the Oklahoma Department of Commerce and we'll be sharing an exhibit booth with them. Total cost for the booth is $2,300 and the commission share will be $1,150. And Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission staff will be uh, on the Reed campus uh, representing you well and we staff recommends approval of this sponsorship. We've been doing this for many years, haven't we? Yes. It's a great event. They do it a is. fantastic job. Great. I, I shall move. Second. have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Call the roll, please. Vice Chair Conway. Aye. Vice Chair Phillips. Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Grayson. Looks like EAA Adventure. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Good morning. I just want to give you one last update before we head off to EA or Venture Oshkosh next week. Uh, we have a great group of partners uh, that we've partnered together to represent Oklahoma at this wonderful uh, occasion in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, we call it, you know, the, it is the air show of the United States. Some would say it probably rivals the Paris air show or the Farm Bar air show. Uh, I know it is the air show for general aviation. Uh, this year we have a great group of community sponsors. I'm just gonna read some names. Uh, Enid, Shawnee, Ardmore, Weatherford, uh, Guthrie and Edmond, Bartlesville, Ada are our community sponsors that we're going to be having this year join us. Uh, we also have some other sponsors, ourselves, OG&E, Department of Commerce, and then Western Farmers Electric Cooperative is going to be a lunch sponsor, which you all know the, uh, the highlight of the whole week is our Inhofe uh, luncheon that we have on Saturday afternoon where we bring in Senator Inhofe, Oklahoma friends and aviators that want to come to Oklahoma to talk about current issues in the aviation world, general aviation world in particular. I know uh, Chairman and President uh, of EAA will be there to speak uh, as well. He's not an Oklahoman, but he's an adopted Oklahoman. He has a house out on Grand Lake uh, there in Northeast Oklahoma. So he always gives us a good opportunity when we come to his show. So I don't know if any of you are attending EAA this year, but if you are, look forward to seeing you at EAA. We have a booth in Hangar C, 3141, um, towards the north end of that hangar. And we'll be doing the lunch in the uh, typical place what you do, it's kind of the, the nature area, nature pavilion area uh, over by the pond. So for any of you that are there, any friends that are coming to EAA, please tell them to stop by, please tell them to come, and we will get them the information. I'll Great. stand for any questions. She's there. Yeah. Check APC privatization to be front and center at all. I don't think you'll be able to have visit with Chairman Schuster there. Uh, I don't think he'll be there drumming up support for the proposal. That, that would be a uh, hostile environment, I think, for Chairman <laughs> Schuster. Any, any questions? Uh, aviation Economic Impact Study. Uh, as you all know, this has been a, a two-year effort now. We are finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, what we have on the front screen here is kind of our, our draft front cover for the executive summary, which is really going to be the, the centerpiece for this study. Uh, as you can see, we have all modes of aviation represented up there. We have military, we have commercial, we have 
biz av and we have general aviation so and it's kind of cut off on the bottom you have more of the the runway that that aircraft's taking off onto so you can kind of see this is the scheme and, and hopefully we're going to be releasing this in the middle of august so you all will see the the final product certainly uh next page this is the preliminary uh, study numbers for the economic impact obviously we looked at three large areas all our study airports the 109 study airports and any businesses or entities that were going to be on those airports we looked at off airport aviation aerospace employers and then obviously military military aviation military aviation military aviation being the largest one of those three uh, but you can obviously see that the other two are, are very well very generous to the oklahoma economy i know this puts us solidly in number two in terms of economies in Oklahoma, probably sometimes number one when oil and gas is, is having a little dip. Uh, so it is obviously aviation aerospace is very important to the state. We have diversified our economy uh, in terms of our employment and the economic impact. Uh, last slide is just a, a brief snapshot of what the economic impacts of our military aviation broken out look like. Uh, we have the Oklahoma, this is the Army Guard, uh, the, not the, the 138th at Tulsa or the 137th here in Oklahoma City. That's just the, the military aviation units for the Army, and then Vance, Tinker, and Altus. Obviously, Tinker makes up a lion's share of the economic impact at about $17 billion, but Altus and Vance are certainly contributing a large economic impact to western Oklahoma. As I said again, hopefully in the middle of August, we will roll this study out. We'll have everything finished with a bow tie on top, and we'd like to invite you all to our airport, statewide airport tour that hopefully we're going to be able to accomplish uh, in the month of August. That being said, I'll, I'll stand for questions. I want to go over a little bit what our plan is on the site yet to be determined, but that the kickoff Monday, August 14th, and then touch upon just a little bit the training for the for the uh, airport sponsors. So we're gonna have we're gonna kick this off hopefully with a press conference uh, on the, the week of August 14th, that Monday, hopefully here somewhere in Oklahoma City, and then we'll start our statewide tour going around to some of the more prominent communities. They're gonna have larger economic impacts: Enid, Guyman. Uh, Durant, Ardmore, Tulsa, obviously, uh, and, and just go around for that entire week, go around the state to ensure that the communities understand how to use this study, that the economics, the aviation economics in their communities is, is a very large and important piece. So we'll be hitting up various good airports, various aerospace companies, so on and so forth. Now one of the, one of the prime things for this study is not just getting the numbers. You don't want to just have numbers and then set them on a shelf. Uh, you want to have numbers and be able to use those numbers, understand those numbers, because numbers by themselves, it's not really helpful. You have to understand how those numbers were created, what they're going to be useful for, so on and so forth. So one of the big things for this is training. Uh, we're going to have a two-day training piece. Uh, first day is going to be in September at OML, the OML conference we're going to be going to on Thursday. We're going to do a one-hour kind of uh, firestorm training session for city managers and, and other city officials that won't be able to attend our full-blown training on the following day, which is going to be somewhere here in Oklahoma City. Uh, it'll be about a three or four hour training event where we're going to teach airport, mem airport managers, airport board members, local city officials, how to use this study in their local community, how to connect the dots, two plus two equals four, so on and so forth. So, anything else? Any questions? Great. No questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item. AOPA regional fly-in. AOPA regional fly-in. Uh, AOPA used to do an annual conference kind of similar to what National Business Aviation Association and, and EAA do, uh, but AOPA's was just not, not well attended. So several years ago they reformed their process and decided to do regional fly-in events. They usually do about four a year, four regional fly-ins across the country. Uh, Walt Strong, Max Wester Westheimer Airport was lucky enough to be able to put in a bid and, and receive this year one of this year's fly-ins. It's going to be September 8th and 9th uh, down there at Max Westheimer Airport. Uh, AOPA tells me that over 700 aircraft will be in attendance. They typically expect between 6,000 and 7,000 attendees, but because w Max Westheimer is also doing this in conjunction with their annual airport festival, uh, we might be able to get that number close to 10,000 attendees over the course of this two-day event. I know the president, Mark Baker of AOPA, will be there. I know local legislators will be there. Hopefully, Senator Inhofe will be able to join us on Saturday. Uh, it is an away game, Ohio State away game weekend, so hopefully uh, the community of Norman, those that aren't traveling to, to Ohio, will, will be able to join us in attendance. But it's, it's a great thing. It's a great economic asset to have one of these come to the community. Lots of hotel rooms sold, lots of rental cars, uh, and lots of good training uh, and good general aviation discussion to occur there at Max West Armour Airport. 
going to be asking for a sponsorship in the, num in the amount of $1,500 for this event. Uh, staff recommends approval, but I'll stand to answer any questions. Will we have a booth there? Or we'll have a booth, okay. and we're going to, uh, we haven't really decided what the sponsorship's going to be. We have a couple options. One, we can T-shirts, programs, uh, several of the giveaways, but yes, we'll have a booth there in the, uh, the booth program, and then where our name's going to be mentioned, we'll, we'll determine that as to what the, what the value that we can get, whether it's going to be on T-shirts, whether it's going to be on programs, pilot giveaways, so on and so forth. Hopefully we can promote our new license plate. Well, I know Sandra's going to be hard working to get signatures <laughs> that day. Uh, if we can get all 6,000 or 7,000 people, that, that's, that's a good start. Wow. We're going to have two plates. Two, one for the application for the license plate, the other plate's just for general contributions to aeronautics. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll pass it around. It's as long as it's not like a over four and a half million, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Good goal. Thank Thanks. you, Commissioner. <laughs> Come on, Walt. God, we try to make sure you get a 50% cut. We have a motion. Move to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions? None? Call the roll, please. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much, Grace. Thank you. A footnote, uh, AOPA members and EAA members will busy be there busy volunteering for everything from parking airplanes to handing ice cream cones. So I think I have about uh, 250 volunteers. I'll be, I'll be right there with you. Are yeah. you volunteering? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm doing it just for the T-shirt. Well, right. I'm doing it just for the ice cream. <laughs> All right, next item is a three-year capital improvement program, Grace. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, this is a two tweaks uh, that kind of go hand in hand with the capital improvement program. Uh, right now we have a, a project slated in the 18 to 20 CIP for uh, construction of a new terminal building at Lawton Fort Sill Regional Airport. Uh, in talking with the airport manager there, they have a couple other priorities in terms of projects that they'd like to do first and they need a little extra time to get their local funding, their bonding issues uh, involved. They'd like to do an ARF building, the firefighting structure uh, building to be put in first. They'd also like to do a maintenance building as well. So they have requested to move their project, which was slated for 18 this year, back to FY20. So I have a motion. Second. And a second. Any questions on it? No questions, please call the roll. Vice Chair Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes. Item B, great. And, and item B is a, is a sister amendment to item A. Um, now that we have a, an opening, we had a terminal building scheduled for 2020 for the Enid Woodring Regional Airport, and, and they have been very uh, forthcoming in letting me know that they'd like to be able to move up at whatever point they can, so they want to have a shovel-ready project. I know they've received several local donations, uh, I think totaling up, and I think we have uh, Dan Onis George here. Uh, you want to come up and say a few words, but totaling almost a half million dollars. And so their goal is to have a, a project designed by Christmas to ready to go to bid uh, in the later winter months. So I'll let Dan speak. Morning. Uh, yes, we have over a million dollars right now ready to go. And uh, I spoke with our uh, uh, contractor many months ago and said we wanted to have a shovel ready project by the end of the year, just in case a situation like this arose. And we're happy to, to move on and take it. Thank you. Uh, staff recommends approval moving this project from FY 2020 to FY 2018. I'll stand for questions. I so move. Motion. Second. And a second. Any further questions? Okay, call the roll, please. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. I have uh, five items for your consideration this morning. <clears throat> the first item is for a project that is currently identified in the approved capital improvement program for Claremore. The project consists of reconstructing the runway. Uh, <clears throat> the existing runway is severely cracked and has a poor soil underneath it, so they're going to grind up the existing asphalt, mix it in with the soil, recompact it, and then put new asphalt on top of that and then uh, do a major crack repair on the connecting taxiways. Total project cost is $2.266 million. FA is providing a little over $2 million. Commission is providing uh, $113,200. Uh, 
A local share is 115700 and the commission is providing half the local match. Uh, staff recommends approval. Motion? Motion to approve. Have a motion to approve. Second. And a second. Any further questions? Please call the roll. Aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. Item B. Next item for your consideration is a grant for Elk City of Elk City. The project consists of uh, widening the uh, center portion of the runway, which is that red or the taxiway, that center portion is that red area there. They're going to widen that, uh, put in new uh, LED lights. On the north end of the runway, that blue section on the taxiway, they're going to do a crack seal and seal coat that. And then they're going to do a major rehab on the main apron down there, uh, repair the joints and cracks there. Total project cost is a little over 1.4 million. FA shares just under 1.3 million. Uh, commission is providing $71,487. Local match $71,489. Uh, the commission is providing half the local match. The staff recommends approval. We have a motion. So moved. Motion. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Please call the roll. Aye. 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 <coughs> Aye. Motion passes. Item C, Dale. The next item is an amendment to an existing grant, which was the uh, Lawton 2017 grant to do a pavement study on the uh, on the Airside pavements, uh, uh, when they initially si uh, uh, negotiated the contract, the existing information indicated that the uh, cores and the pavement out there was 12 inches thick. And when they got out there and started cutting the cores, it turned out to be a 13 or 30 inches thick. Uh, so they needed additional equipment and manpower. And this amendment will increase the uh, grant, uh, the commission share by $4,344. And local match 229 and the total cost is uh, increases 4573 it's for the uh, manpower and equipment to uh, get the cores out of the out of the holes staff recommends approval I shall move. have a motion second. Yes. and a second any further questions hearing none call the roll aye aye Passes, item D. Next item is for a project that's currently identified in the uh, Commission's Approved Capital Improvement Program for uh, Miami Regional Airport. Uh, the project consists of installing new uh, LED medium intensity runway lights, a omnidirectional system off the end of the uh, runway, uh, installing new pappies, new vault, and uh, electrical gate, and a AWOS. Total project cost is just under 1.2 million. Uh, this is a combination of state funds and non-primary entitlement funds, which is uh, the funds that the uh, Congress gives the airport directly. It doesn't have any state apportionment, which is money that comes to us by way of our land mass and population or discretionary money. So it's a it's kind of a local and state uh, project. Total cost just under 1.2 million, uh, 426,000 from the FAA, and that's their non-primary entitlement funds. Uh, commission shares 473,393. Local matches local matches 82,790. And staff recommends approval. Okay. We have a motion. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Second. second. And a second. Any questions? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Item E, Dale. Final project is at uh, Pahuska. It is identified in the Commission's Capital Improvement Program. Uh, the approval is contingent upon receiving a bid, uh, a grant application based on bids. Uh, the project is to uh, repair the cracks on the runway, crack seal, and there are some failed areas on the uh, pavement. The total project cost is estimated to be 150,000. Uh, commission share 142,500. Local share is 7,500. Staff recommends approval. Some of the cracks out there are three inches wide, so we need to get them fixed. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further questions? Dear Commissioner, Potter, the fellow, this is me. 
for the aircraft that are coming from around the world for the Pioneer Woman's Restaurant? She's averaging between 12 and 15,000 people a week in her. Well, maybe we should strengthen it. I know, Pahuska, <laughs> I understand. So it's, wow. it's... My wife's it, been among them. It's astronomical what <laughs> she's done in that little town. Wow. And I'm sure there's aircraft coming in now. See, we had a motion and a second, and call the roll, please. Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, Dale. You. Catherine Tabor. Aircraft Pilot Protection. Good morning. We've already spoken quite a bit about APA this morning, so I just want to update you on the applications that we have received and the permits we've issued. Um, we have issued six permits for a wind farm near Visai. Um, actually, no, we have six pending, I'm sorry. And then we have issued 23 um, permits for the same wind farm in Visai. We are, are holding off on the power line near El Reno because it will probably be moved. Um, so we haven't issued anything for that yet. And then we have 14 pending application or 14 permits issued for a wind farm in Tallahena. And one thing I failed to add is five um, permits for a wind farm near Anadarko. And then since our last meeting, we have done four courtesy reviews. Um, there is a company called Branch Communications that builds cell towers in the state. And every single time they're going to build one, they reach out to us. So that's great. Um, all, four, all four of those were from Branch Communications this time. So um, are there any questions about APA? Thank you. I guess the aerospace and aviation education grant, please. Um, we are going to be having our meeting on August 9th for the education grant program. So I hope you all will be able to join us for that. We had 29 applicants this year, and total funds requested were about $640,000. So a lot of need out there. We're doing our best to make our budget stretch as far as possible and help as many of those applicants as possible um, so we're in the process of making our recommendations to them and they will be given the opportunity to tell you all a little bit about their programs at the August meeting and then you all will have the final decision on those grants um, so are there any questions about Abbott new applications? Um, we had probably seven or eight new ones I would say um, yeah yeah, quite Thank a few. Yeah. Any further questions? Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Great. Sandra, you're back. Talk about upcoming aviation events. Thank you, commissioners. There's wonderful things happening this fall in aviation. And just a few things. Uh, the Will Rogers Wiley Post Fly-In is happening Saturday, August 12th. And then, of course, the EAA Air Venture Fly-In in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And Tinker and the Primes. And if you'll look behind your tab under Aviation Events, you'll see that there um, is a backyard fly-in grill and barbecue at the Frederick Masonic Lodge. And the airborne dem demonstration team uh, is having an open hangar day over at Frederick um, on July 22nd. And um, there is a UAS business and contracting symposium at Metrotech. And I brought flyers over here for the commission and for the audience. And uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, Oak Mulgee is having their first air show. And uh, we're very excited about that. We've been in conversations with them. And uh, it will be September 30th. Thank you, commissioners. Great. Sounds like a busy time. Thank you very much. Director Berg. Concluding remarks. Thank you, commissioners. Um, did want to point something out. Commissioner Ray asked for all your indulgence and forgiveness uh, I think he was bailing hay till about three this morning uh, I don't understand that part of the the agriculture world I have to admit I never bailed hay perhaps I should most people would 
Yeah, I think you're right, uh, but that's, that's, that's why he's not here today. Uh, a couple things about the economic impact. We do know that, that uh, Governor Fallon will be with us on that Monday, August 14th. It will be in the afternoon. Uh, estimated time right now, probably sometime between 1.30 and 2.30 will, will begin. We are trying to have it at the Oklahoma History Center right under the Winnie May. Uh, we think that would be a very good venue, uh, easy parking, easy access, and we are expecting a large crowd. All of our airport sponsors will, of course, be invited, but just to give you a little, along with Governor Fallon, you'll have Secretary Patterson, Secretary Snodgrass, Secretary Asher, better known to many as the Adjutant, Adjutant General. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, support we think we'll have there and a kind of attendance and many, many aviation companies represented as well. So we do hope you can make that and then we will have other events uh, throughout the course of the week and certainly an event in Tulsa. I want to underscore again that the final uh, amount we needed, $50,000 to complete the study, uh, we would not have been able to finish it without the assistance of our friends at the Tulsa Airport Authority and Tulsa Chamber and the Oklahoma City Airport Authority. So we appreciate them very much. The, uh, you, you heard about Catherine's uh, uh, summary of APA, and one thing we are, we have begun looking, and even before now, uh, where we receive applications and we know of wind farms that are going up, where are those, because we know where these, you know, where are they impacting the military training airspace. And we've started to see, much like, rep, much, not, much like represented in the map on the assigned routes to Vance Air Force Base, an impact, a, a large impact. Right now we, we can't do anything about that. But I'm sure you could see by that map just the ones under construction and the additional proposed further degradation of those military training routes, which just that's something that uh, we must somehow uh, find a way to bring some balance to that situation. Aviation education, just a quick note on that. I believe last year our budgeted amount for, or this, this immediate past fiscal year, our budgeted amount for aviation education was around $215,000. Uh, our, the amount requested has gone up. One thing, I find it almost a direct corollary that as this funding goes down for schools, et cetera, we're getting more applications for things we never got before. Fund a new class force. Fund a new, well, we, <laughs> we're not in that business. I think that would be the legislature's business, so we cannot take the place of the legislature. We can't stand in those shoes, uh, but we continue to try to help certainly where we can and help good programs so that we can get more young people and, and adult people going into aviation as a career because that's what ultimately this is about, increasing the pipeline of skilled workers that will allow us to maintain the aviation industry that we do. We, we only have that because of the aviation workforce that we have. That uh, would conclude my remarks. Are there any remarks of the commissioners about the items on, on the agenda? I'm good. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you, Director Burton. I'm gonna stay up here for the next item if I could, uh, Mr. Chair Mr. Vice Chairman. Well, uh, as I understand it, the, the next meetings will be on August 9th at 10 o'clock. That, that, that is a special meeting. We should have made that. The next two meetings we're talking about is our regularly scheduled meetings, uh, which right now are set for Wednesday, September the 20th, and Wednesday, November the, help me here, folks, 12th, 17th. What are we, what are we talking about? Okay, while well, we find that. We, we have a, we think we have a problem with, with uh, each time, September 20th, for example, that is the date right now of the interim study for the military training airspace issue. So that is not a good date. It also will be, uh, some people will just be getting back. Naseo is the week before. Uh, for several reasons, it's a conflict. We're, we're suggesting that be moved to September 27th. And then this simply because of how late, one of the big reasons how late it's been pushed back into September, uh, we're suggesting that I believe the November meeting uh, be moved into, our, it's November 8th right now, and we're recommending that that be moved to, did we say early December? December the 6th because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And, and again, though, we're moving September so far back. We like to try to, we, 
We'd like to get as many issues to you all as we can because we meet every other month. So that's uh, our recommendations would be September 27th. Uh, and uh, yes. Yeah, we don't have uh, uh, something else I need to discuss with you. Yes, go ahead. On October the 4th? Okay. So that's another reason we're, we're moving uh, November back. Uh, one other accommodation we are, that's very important to us and we're trying to make, Secretary Patterson has informed me that he intends to make all our meetings. And it's very, we, we try to make it very convenient. There's a really big problem. On the Wednesday we're having the meeting right now, the second Wednesday of the month, that is also the very same day the governor's cabinet meets. So in between those two conflicts, I think he has to pick to be there for his boss. So we want to find a different Wednesday at all, as well. We'll do that in December when we set our regularly scheduled meetings for the next calendar year. But we will need to be looking for something different than the second Wednesday. I know we'll need to factor in issues like Commissioner Potter, that the third Wednesday is somewhat of an issue because of a bank board meeting. So we want to try to make it accommodating. I think we'll look at something like the first Wednesday, fourth Wednesday, or other days. Uh, if we have to move from here, it works well here, but you know that would be a last alternative. But the issues before you, we're recommending no, October the 4th, correct? October the 4th and, and December the 26th. December the 6th. We have a motion to approve. I so move. I have a second. motion and a second. Any further questions? Call the roll, please. Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes. And we will inform all commissioners of these changes, of course, and 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 reinform you, so you won't forget. Great. Thank you. Thank Vic. you, commissioners. Is there any new business anybody would like to approach? Walt, would you like to come up? <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Uh, Walt Strong, Westheimer Airport in Norman. It seems that the older I get, the more difficult I find it to pass up an open microphone, especially if I get to talk to my friend Dave. Uh, several things uh, revolving about uh, some of the stuff that's been talked about here. One, thank you very much for approving the grant for the uh, AOPA fly-in. I was, I was telling Dave earlier, or Dave or Dave, uh, you know, years ago I, was, I had an opportunity to be in Korea just for a week or two, and somebody offered me a piece of dried squid while I was there. So I'm living on the edge. I tried the dried squid, and I found out that the more you chew on it, the bigger it gets. Can you say AOPA fly in? The more you chew on it, the bigger it gets. Oh Lord, this thing is turning into just massive and the amount of items, it just seems like one thing touches another. So we really do appreciate your support in the, in the $1,500 grant. And in that, uh, we will still have our Friday morning Chamber of Commerce aviation breakfast on Friday, September 8th. It'll be at 7 o'clock or 7.30 in the big hangar, which this time will be set up for show center for AOPA. And our guest speaker will be Mark Baker, uh, president of AOPA. He'll be there to speak. We anticipate 200, 250 uh, folks in attendance. Please come. You are all invited, as well as Vic and the staff. Please come out and, and join us for that event. And finally, um, as, as one watches at a pretty close distance, the uh, Sooner Flight Academy. Uh, I was talking to Catherine earlier about the grants for these educational programs. Gentlemen, may I say to you that I have watched this Sooner Flight Academy grow. Uh, actually, it was the Naseo uh, Award winner for educational programs when I was here on staff back in uh, the early 90s. Uh, so it has grown. I watch the children that come through from the little bitty guys up to the kids that are in their 14, 15, 16 years old. 
they're flying kites, they're shooting rockets, they're, they're flying airplanes, they're learning about lift, gravity, thrust, drag, they get all of this stuff. And the biggest thing is, you know, there's certain things in life that'll really put a smile on your face. For me, it's walking down there and seeing these kids come through that program and the smile that's on their face. And my grandson just went through it for the second year and he's just, Papa, this is great. Yeah, I mean, he just, they love it. So please, if you can find it in your budget, I'd fund that Sooner Flight Academy 100%. I seriously doubt, and I'd bet my job on it. I'd seriously doubt that you will find a, I, I, I seriously doubt you will find a better aviation education program in the state of Oklahoma, even in the United States. This thing is top shelf, guys. And I really encourage you, ask you to support it as best you can. So thank you for your uh, moment, and uh, thank you for letting me be here. Is there any other b new business, or anybody would like to, the microphone? Okay. Then no new business. I uh, declare the meeting adjourned.